Hello and welcome back to the show. So I am super excited to introduce my guest for this episode because she has overcome a lot in her life and has become a successful broker in both real estate and mortgage. So today my guest is Stephanie Boyd. She uh, started from humble beginnings, but became a super successful entrepreneur. And we're going to be digging into that today in our conversation. And uh, hearing how we can, you know, overcome the different adversities that we come across in our life and uh, become successful and actually use that to strengthen ourselves. So without further ado, I want to bring on my guest and uh, welcome to the show, Stephanie. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited uh, to kind of dig into your background and your story. So um, just kind of right off the bat, if you don't mind, uh, you know, introducing yourself a little bit and telling us, you know, how you came to be and, you know, what got you started in real estate and what was life like that, you know, before that? And, you know, how did you turn that into a successful career? All right. Well, so then I will start in the middle. Um, I got my real estate license in 2000 when I joined my family's brokerage. My mom was just a, an awesome independent thinker, entrepreneur, and she started as an appraiser and then she got her broker license. And then at that time, there was no loan license. There was no NMLS. It was pre-housing crash, um, you know, 2008. And so it was kind of the wild, wild west. So we just learned how to do loans and we did loans in real estate. Um, so, and then the crash happened and a lot of things changed. So backing up before that to the beginning, um, I was a teenage mom at 16. Um, everybody told me that was a horrible idea. And so just to spite them, I went ahead and graduated college two years or graduated high school two years early and went straight to college um, at 16 because I knew that the only way to avoid becoming a terrible statistic of teenage motherhood was to get an education. So also, I thought it was an added bonus that they would pay me to go to school, at, whereas in high school, you do not get paid. So I also passed this excellent advice along to my sons when they reached their teenage years. Um, and so uh, I have three sons. One of them is getting out of the Air Force in about two weeks. Um, one of them is married with a couple of cute little daughters. And my middle son just moved to Ohio to forge his way in the world. Um, and so I raised some independent thinkers there and put them out into the world. And I'm very proud that I um, managed to get some fine young men out into the economy, uh, making some babies, serving their country proudly. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of hopping around in the story, but in there, my first career was as a criminal defense investigator. So um, my dad told me one day that I was really good at arguing and I should be a lawyer. And I was like, well, I do love to argue, but going to become a lawyer sounds like it's going to take a long time. And I kind of stumbled into this job with the county as a criminal defense investigator largely because everyone else that wanted that job as a criminal investigator wanted to work with the district attorney. And this job was specifically with the public defender and it was defending the rights of the indigent accused of a variety of horrible crimes from shoplifting to murder. Um, I represented them all. I had a very good track record with um, finding all of the information to exonerate them. Very few of my overall clients that I worked with ended up uh, serving the life sentence. So I entered this male dominated field where nobody liked me, basically. I was a young ex upstart. It was law enforcement oriented and I was definitely um, a free thinker way more than they were used to. So my boss wasn't a huge fan of me, so he tried to get me to fail by putting me on the three strikes and homicide team like the first week. So instead, I excelled. I made friends with all the lawyers. We kicked a lot of ass. And um, what do they say? Kicking ass and chewing bubble gum. And we were all out of bubble gum. Uh, so 
I did that for about five years before kind of the office politics and just the heaviness of that whole load kind of got to me. And I was a young mom. Uh, my youngest son was like one and a half. I had three little boys and it was long hours, weekends, you know, a lot of sacrificing time with my kids, my family, um, my husband that I eventually did get towards the middle, the early middle of this story. Um, so yeah, I, during that job, I kind of developed a passion for defending the rights of the less fortunate. Um, I had a murder case that was in a homeless encampment on the river. So I ended up spending like an entire summer on the river interviewing these people at these camps. And as a result of that, we started a legal defense clinic for them because they were getting a lot of um, illegal camping tickets and the police would come and sweep them and take all their property and their dogs and impound the dogs and put the people in jail eventually. And it was all the beginnings of what has become a horrendously huge crisis, you know, 20 something years later, 23, 25, geez, the time flies. That was in 95. So yeah, um, I did that till about 2000, got into real estate, continued my passion for serving my um, underserved neighbors along the way, you know, <clears throat> here and there. During the pandemic, I just started making food for like 100 people a day and taking it out and serving it because, uh, well, everything else was shut down. So I still had this budget for marketing. I wanted to still reach out and try to build my clientele and make some uh content for my social media you know so i also ended up meeting a lot of people in the volunteering and networking community who needed real estate and loan services and it really worked as a way to just have something to talk about and plus too it's deeply ingrained in my heart to want to do something when I see something tragic happening and something unfair and unjust. And so when the pandemic started, I saw just every time I went out of my house, the whole street was empty. There's no traffic. The restaurants are closed. Everybody's locked down. And all you can see are tents everywhere and human beings living on the side of the road who now don't have access to food or water anywhere because everything's shut down. So very quickly, a lot of other volunteers came out of the woodworks. I ran into a lot of people out there doing that work. We formed a coalition, which turned into a nonprofit, which sprang a couple other nonprofits in the direction of like reducing food waste. So there's, for example, um, a free fridge, several free fridges around Sacramento. Um, this one lady I know has uh, sponsored this and made it into a nonprofit and just tons of people just take their food leftovers um, and put them in the fridges. And then the people that are underserved in the neighborhood or food insecure can just go there and get a meal out of the free fridge. So that's kind of a long story long. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you have a wonderful story, Stephanie. So just, I just want to, you know, acknowledge that at the, at the moment, because you've overcome so much and it just seems like a, a recurring theme in your entire story, in your, in your life, really, that you're overcoming adversity and you're overcoming, you know, archetypes almost and, you know, dominating in, in industries that other people might, you know, from the outside looking in might not think that you will be able to dominate and overcoming these, these challenges that people are putting up for you, whether if it's, you know, happenstance or, you know, intentional as well. So just from that, you know, what, what is you know, I guess like some of the biggest things and the, and the most important lessons that you learned from just overcoming all these different challenges and, you know, now becoming a successful entrepreneur and actually giving back to the community of the underserved, just like, uh, you know, when you started as well. Well, I guess one of the main recurring themes that flows through my mind when it's that, for one thing, there but for the grace of God go I like in all of these circumstances right like imagine a guy who's falsely accused of some crime and I had a lot of people that were surely guilty but I had a lot of people that were also definitely innocent and so 
just imagine that you're just living your life and someone IDs you and you get rolled up in a burglary case. And now because of some thing that happened 25 years ago when you were a teenager that you got charged as an adult for, now you're looking at life in prison and all you were doing is walking home from work, you know, like, that kind of thing just always struck me as like, oh my gosh, I'm so blessed and lucky to have made it through all of these challenges and to have the life that I have and live the life that I'm living. Um, how could I not try to like give a helping hand to the people that are struggling that I could easily be struggling that hard? Um, so, you know, people in the camps used to ask me like, what church are you with? And I was like, I'm not with a church. I'm just a lady that has some extra time and money right now. And I just realized that I could very easily be in the tent next to you, given different circumstances. And so do you want a sandwich? Yes or no? <laughs> like, uh, So yeah, I would just say never give up. That's my advice. Um, I mean, there's so much free education out there. Um, you're never too old to walk into your local community college and sign up, take the assessment test, uh, get some grant money, get yourself, you know, a Pell Grant, a Board of Governors Grant. I never paid tuition when I was doing all of this. I just went to the financial aid office. Um, and then when the real estate market crashed, I actually went back to school and I got a second degree in art because I was having a bit of an existential crisis after the real estate market collapsed. And I was like, oh God, everything has just changed overnight. It was like as drastic as the pandemic kind of in a different way. And uh, the only thing I could think of was like, well, at least there's always art. Why don't I just learn how to paint portraits or something? <laughs> so I actually went back and learned how to uh, learned sign language and got a degree in art and took a bunch of portrait classes and abstract art and, and just had a great time meeting new people um, at City College. So yeah, I would just say never give up, never stop learning, never um, just always find something to become fulfilled by because a lot of times like a person could be tempted to just sit there and wallow in their circumstances and it does get overwhelming to I mean that's what really started me with serving food during the pandemic was when the shutdowns happened I was just incredibly overwhelmed by all of it and like most people were just like we felt like there was nothing we could do about this thing and we're being like told to stay home and yet all this sadness is happening right outside our door where people who are our neighbors are literally starving out there like uh <clears throat> and I just really just couldn't sit there and do nothing and um so it was just that overwhelming feeling that I was like okay I have to do something about this to control my own life somehow like I don't know if that's like an OCD kind of problem or uh, a self-employed person's perspective on like, what do you do when just everything seems like it's too much? And so all I could think of was, well, I have some extra money, I have some extra time. I'm not really allowed to go anywhere. Like I couldn't go into the title companies to sign documents with my clients. Uh, a lot of people were refinancing. so everything is like online, all my loan applications are coming in, you know, my processor is processing them. And so I was just free to take the time and money that I had, that I would normally take clients out to lunch or go to coffee or network with some realtors or whatever, and just spend it on food. And it helped me like, feel like I was a little bit in control of my life, I guess. And so that's the lesson that I like teach myself when I get overwhelmed facing these adversities and challenges. Uh, I remember one time, there was one time in, when I was younger, my life really sucked. I was going through a divorce. Uh, the crash was happening. Everything was kind of coming apart. And I woke up just like, it was raining. It was miserable out. I had three little kids and no money. 
and going through a divorce and all of this. And I was like, okay, guys, here's what we're doing today. Uh, we're going to buy some beans, some tomato sauce, some uh, hamburger meat. We're making a giant vat of chili and we're going out in the rain to serve the people at the park that are homeless. And they're like, what? Like, what? And I was like, yes, because we have so much to share and there's people out there that have way less than us. And like, we need to do something to like, I don't know the words I put it in at the moment, but you know, like we had to check ourselves really because we really still are so much more privileged than so many other people in the world, in our community, on our streets, outside our doors. You know, I don't know where you live, but I live and work between Sacramento and San Francisco. And so I end up in Oakland on the streets of San Francisco, Sacramento, and the growing number of tents and um, shanty towns is just astounding. And so I feel like when you get overwhelmed by these things in life, which whatever hurdles they are, whether they're internal or external, um, action is always what helps me to overcome the adversity, whether it's taking an art class and learning a new skill or just going out and seeing like, what change can I make in the world right now? And like, as cheesy as it sounds, I found myself thinking of those bracelets that say WWJD on it. And like, whatever, think of like, whatever the highest ideal of greatness, what would that person do? Like they would go out and feed the hungry. They would try to help sick people. They would try to you know, do something positive, productive, even though you might be feeling sorry for yourself. It's really helpful to get some perspective and go out to where people are actually suffering and where they actually have much less and try to just make a small change whenever you can. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of good stuff there that you, you know, you just told, uh, you know, and just shared with the audience here. And it's really wonderful. And I think one of the big things that I got in there was that you were, it's not, I think a lot of people feel like that, you know, when people are overcoming adversity or people who have overcome a lot of challenges in their life, that they somehow don't feel overwhelmed and they're, you know, stone cold and emotionless. But I think what you mentioned there is that whenever these things were happening, you did feel overwhelmed just like anybody else. And you were overcoming it instead of just letting it take you, you know, kind of take you down, but you were you know, combating it and, and taking it head on. So I think, you know, if you don't mind touching on that a little bit, you know, I think a lot of people, I'm sure when people are talking to you as well, they, they just feel like you never feel overwhelmed, you're super together, and all these challenges, they don't phase you. But you know, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the reality of that. Definitely not. In fact, I've been so blessed in my life to come across things like, okay, so after the collapse of the real estate market in 07, 08, um, I got a massage therapy license. And so a lot of people in my office actually did because the real estate and mortgage thing was so stressful. We were like looking for the opposite of stressful. So, um, and in that we were trained in like Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, deep breathing. So like, I just sort of wandered into this thinking I needed a new job. I wandered into this whole basically coping mechanism, like therapy, free therapy session. So um, yeah, becoming just more self-aware and like kind of just always seeking to learn how to control something. What I learned along the way is that uh, controlling your breathing and moving your body is like so beneficial to your mental health and your well-being and like a lot of times I, so there's like this seasonal affective just depression thing, sad. And like there's studies about people in places like Seattle and Portland where it rains a lot. And so they don't get any UV rays. They don't get any exercise because you're inside and it's raining and it's yucky outside. So people get caught into this cycle where they just get more and more sad, depressed, obese, sedentary, uh, 
And then the more obese and sedentary you are, the less you want to go outside. And the less nice and sunny it is, the less you want to go outside. And then the less vitamin D and sunshine you get, the more depressed and obese you get. And it's just this whole cycle that in our um, Western way of thinking, we just want to like, drive into the garage, go to the office, go to the doctor for a pill. If something isn't feeling right, go back. And all of this without too much human communication, possibly without a lot of exercise movement. Like it's pretty shocking to think of the a number of people that are just so unhealthy in our country. And so um, I think a lot of what helps me get through the rough days is just you know, those skills of deep breathing, meditating, keeping your blood pressure down, keeping your spirits up, you know, um, I've done some experiments on smiling versus frowning at people. And it turns out like 100% of the time, if you're walking around scowling in a bad mood, nobody wants anything to do with you. If you're smiling and happy, um, then everybody likes you. And so it's like real easy calculus to figure out these little switches that you can flick on and off to like improve your daily circumstances. And so I feel like, you know, I get overwhelmed a lot, but I just can't succumb to like wallowing in it for too long because I know that there's way too many people out there that have it worse than me. And if I can't do anything about my immediate circumstance, at least maybe I can make somebody a sandwich and make their day better or something like it's all about perspective so I feel like it's real important to keep your perspective fluid you know keep an eye on just have that view of where other people are at where you're at and just see where we can meet in the middle see where we can adjust our perspective and welcome someone else's way of thinking or you know just at least expand our horizons to include the other people on the planet because I think it's really easy to get self-absorbed and when you're self-absorbed and wallowing then um, frankly it's just not a good look for an entrepreneur you cannot go out and you can't network you can't market you can't do any of the things that you need to do to drive your success if you can't get out of your pajamas because interest rates are going up exponentially every single day. Um, I mean, cause there's day-to-day -day challenges going on now uh, for sure in this industry. Um, I keep an eye on a lot of social media groups like realtor groups and everything. And um, the, all of the signs are there for a uh, second coming of the 2008 um, I mean, it's seeming to hit a little slower because the Fed has been trying to pull the brakes for the past year and a year now or so. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people that are going to need to learn how to pivot, um, come up with some multiple streams of income, come up with some backup plans. Uh, and so yeah, I think just managing the stress through all that diversity uh, really starts with eating healthy food, exercising, doing some deep breathing, um, and just trying to like control the chatter in your mind, control your blood pressure, and just see what you can turn into a positive rather than looking at it from the negative perspective. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. And I think, you know, even just for myself, that when I start taking the time to like you, like you mentioned, taking care of, you know, my own health and doing some deep breathing exercises, and maybe taking a moment to just reflect on, you know, some of the things that I'm really grateful for that I have in my life, and all the, you know, I guess the abundance even surrounding me, um, and everything that's going on, I really do feel a lot better and a lot more motivated and have a lot more energy inside of my body to go out there and, you know, do the business activities that are necessary to kind of, you know, keep your, keep your entrepreneurial, you know, spirit up and keep your business running. And I think a lot of people, what happens is they, they will be so busy, right? Especially agents. And, you know, in this industry, it's a very, 
fast paced industry. There's a lot of moving around and a lot of real estate agents will, you know, they'll say, oh, I'm too busy or uh, I don't have the the time or I can't slow down. I have too much going on. I need the business, right? And then there's, especially in a, in a down market or, you know, when things are, you know, not necessarily as hot as, you know, they were back in, you know, the good days, you know, a lot of agents don't tend to slow down and take care of their health, whether physically or mentally. So, I mean, maybe you could touch on that a little bit, how, you know, maybe taking the time to work on yourself, work on your own mental and physical health, and maybe even taking the time to help other people is actually going to, you know, in return, help you and your business. And you, you know, you do need to slow down a little bit to, you know, speed back up. Definitely. So two things, and I'll give you metaphors about these. The simpler one is just the idea, <clears throat> excuse me, of keeping your own cup full. So we're always pouring out of our cup into others in our community, with our kids, rushing around with our marketing, door knocking, cold calling, whatever we're doing, we're emptying our cup. And so we need to refill our cup as well, uh, which is like, you know, the self-care The maybe sounds a little cliche when you talk about self-care, but it really is the important things like taking a little extra time to make yourself some food with fresh vegetables instead of going through the drive through somewhere. Um, you know, taking the, the simple time to take a walk around the block, if nothing else, and breathe some fresh air and, you know, do that a few times a day once you realize that that's actually good for you. Uh, I've realized uh, more recently that it only takes me like 17 minutes to walk 12 blocks, which is a mile. So if I take 17 minutes out of my day, like three times a day, which is a very small chunk of time and a reasonable chunk of time, then I just walked three miles and got some fresh air, breath, cleared my mind, and it hardly took any time. I mean, weather permitting, you know, but it, I got a little dog recently and the little dog makes me go outside a lot. So um, that's another thing, you know, if you're getting a pet can be a great motivator because now all of a sudden you have to go outside a few times a day and deal with this creature. Um, so yeah, filling up your own cup <clears throat> so that you have plenty spilling over to overflow into the other areas that you have to put energy into. Um, and the other idea came from massage school and there's this story of the broken pot and so this person had to take the pot down to fill the pot up to get water every day and the pot was cracked and it was a very sad little cracked pot. And every day, by the time the person got back up the hill, the pot was mostly empty and it was a sad little pot. And eventually the pot was like so sad that it just told its owner that like, you should just smash me up because I'm no good. And the owner of the pot was like, but look all along the way to the stream, all of these flowers have sprouted because your leaky pot was watering them this whole time. So like, uh, I'm not getting this story 100% correct, but like it's those imperfections within us where our pot is cracked and leaky and where we actually like can blow out goodness into the world in our workings, in our life as we walk through day to day, um, you know, so like maybe it's my personality flaws, my OCD, that my desire and mad need to be in control of things that makes me go out and like frantically cook food for a hundred people because I'm concerned about them not having any food or, you know, I mean, we did some crazy things. I met up with some other crazy people who were just like this Air Force guy. He's a 20 year retired Air Force vet and he decided to spend all of his retirement money building shower trailers and driving around serving homeless camps showers so that people could have a sense of dignity because when he was deployed for the in the desert and work you know grunting around for three or four weeks at a time all he wanted was a change of socks and underwear and a shower to feel human again and he realized that he could like deliver that small dose of humanity to his brothers and sisters in the street and he just spends all of his retirement money and time doing that like five or six days a week. And he like made all these friends in different churches and gets into their parking lots and serves. And so, um, and, and he definitely has like 
some internal issues like he had a terrible childhood and so it's like this coping mechanism um where we've taken our broken pots and we've spilled out our goodness along the way you know even though we've got all of these actual like experiences that could in fact cause us to want to smoke crack in a tent on the side of the road for example you know like why do those people do that because they've been through terrible things most likely you know there's generational homelessness out there there's tons of people who've grown up with one or zero parents both parents incarcerated maybe one parent murdered the other parent and the one is incarcerated and they went through foster care and they were abused by weirdos that get in a position of power over children in foster care and you know there's just all of these things that i've learned so much about humanity just by taking that time to just stop and recognize someone's humanity bring them a sandwich and ask them how they're doing and find out about their life like i guess that's part of my curiosity that made me accept the job as the criminal defense investigator because there's just something inside of me that just like i'm intrigued by the horrifying details of things of humanity of the crime of the murder of the crime scene of like what happened to make you this way and how can i possibly help at all or will i help you by just listening and just by recognizing that you're a person and i'm going to give you 5 minutes of my time and hopefully you won't stab me <laughs> like um, so and then there's that like disregard for your own personal safety that comes into these things at times that's like a lot of people ask me like really why are you doing that like are you actually trying to get stabbed um why why would you go there uh, by yourself like all of my fellow volunteers uh are absolutely horrified that i just go out by myself uh they're like you should and in all the training i never did any training because i was just like look this is what i'm going to do i'm a person i have food money resources i'm allowed to do what i want some states might tell you that you're actually not allowed to do what you want and they've actually like arrested old people in florida for serving the homeless over the years there's a whole movement behind um not being allowed to share food in public spaces um in some counties and states criminalize it i personally believe that if i have food to share and someone over there is hungry i'm going to try to bring them some food but yeah a lot of times without regard for my own personal safety where all of the people who did go through some training through with an organization they're like okay the first rule is never go out by yourself and i'm just like but nobody's always available to go with me and i mean i'm available to do this at 11 o'clock every wednesday or whatever my you know every i mean for a while there i did it every day i would either serve food or i would just go out with coffee and serve people coffee and i had a friend who was making muffins and it was like de decreasing her depression and anxiety about the pandemic to have a baking project to do so i was getting local eggs bringing them to her getting donations of flour delivering them doing porch drop offs and like she was making thousands of muffins and posting on Facebook about how I had given her a renewed sense of life and a purpose and a project. And it was like this whole rippling, overflowing effect that you have in your community when you just go out of your way a little bit to just do something, to see that humanity out there and see what can I do about this, whether I'm with a church or a group or by myself or maybe i don't play well with others i'm not sure because i've always been self-employed ever since i left that county job i don't have a high affinity for being bossed around and told what to do a whole bunch uh so you know maybe i've just taken like those same characteristics that made me a teenage mom where i got you know maybe labeled as like uh Oh, what it's it's worse than being truant. I was like a teenage runaway when I was 13, 14. Uh incorrigible. That's what the court wanted to label me um, as a very young, like 14-year-old. So, like as I'm now a grandma, I might be just as incorrigible as ever in that uh if the state came and told me I'm not allowed to feed my neighbors who are hungry. 
I would go ahead and do it anyway without regard to their rules and their laws. And so maybe that's why essentially I ended up the way that I am. So I would just, oh, I mean, I don't know. I would just encourage people to be a little bit incorrigible. Think for yourself. Think outside of the box. I mean, you have to if you're an entrepreneur. Um, I mean, there are cookie cutter, you know, there are systems. And I do believe there are a lot of systems out there that work very well for people um, who work the systems. And I mean, I'm sure that I have my own systems in my own way. You know, like I have little rules I put myself through to make sure that I do the things that I need to do every day in some fashion or another, you know, but um, I don't know, maybe people need to be a little more incorrigible in their lives and uh, do random acts of kindness for no reason. Um, and maybe find out a little bit about their neighbors and just talk to strangers, even though, I mean, I think we all definitely grew up being encouraged not to talk to strangers um, in this day and age where we can order an Uber and get in a car with a stranger. And uh, then we get in there and we don't have anything to say to them. And we put our headphones on and we just sit there for the ride to the airport silently and like missing a whole opportunity. Like I've had some real interesting conversations with the Uber driver um, and just out in public. Like, I feel like we're looking at our phones a lot these days. We're Maybe we're on the social media interacting with people, but especially since the pandemic, we have suffered from a lack of like face-to-face -face interactions with humans and random strangers and everything. So um, yeah, I say get out there and talk to some strangers, see what they're up to. It's kind of fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I just want to recognize some things that you, you said there. First, first of all, um, the cracked pot story. Right. I think the story you told of, you know, during the pandemic when you were helping a friend out and she was baking muffins and you were bringing, you know, bring the baked goods to, you know, the community and also, you know, just kind of coordinating all of that. That was, you know, in my, when I saw was you were the, you were the pot, you were the pot with a crack in it because what happened was you were, you know, like you, you mentioned there was your OCD or, you know, your need to help people or, uh, you know, whatever it might be, but you, you know, think about all the different people that you helped in that, you know, in that story, right? You helped your, your friend get out of her own depression, uh, but helping her, you know, start a new project. And, you know, you were helping a local business with the, you know, with the eggs that you were bringing over to them. And you were helping other people as well by, you know, sharing the, you know, the, the muffins and the food with them, you know, the, the people in the homeless shelters. And, you know, when your friend posted on social media, how that story rejuvenated her, right? Imagine, you know, think about all the people that she helped you know, maybe rejuvenate and start their own project that were following her on social media. So it's all this, this domino effect, right? So it's like, Definitely. I think people call it the domino effect, the, the butterfly effect, whatever it is, but mm -hmm. we just don't know who we're helping by just being us, right? And just doing the things that, you know, make us fulfilled and happy and, and all the different things that, that we're, we're affecting just by, you know, continuing on our journey, like you said, in the very beginning of the podcast, just, just never giving up. Right. And that was, that was a perfect example of that. I don't know if you, you realize that or not, but the other thing is, you know, I think the word you mentioned was in incorrigible. It was the, the first time I ever, ever heard of that word. So, okay. <laughs> right. I hope, I hope yes, I'm that, getting it right. That's the word. Yeah. Incorrigible. Uh, I love it. I mean, and, and that's, I mean, think about all the great, you know, entrepreneurs or, or the great, you know, visionaries of the world of the past, right? They were all breaking the mold, right? They were all, you know, not necessarily following the established rule or established system. They were doing their own thing. They were, you know, some people like the, the good word, I guess, like the good, the good version of it is like they're, they were mavericks or <laughs> they were people who were, you know, paving their own path, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, maybe, maybe touch on that a little bit, because that's, that's something that I think a lot of people don't, you know, they don't realize is that the, the real visionaries, right, the real people who make a difference, the, the people who establish, you know, these new things that are changing the world for the better, they all were looked down upon, or, or, you know, there's a lot of criticism surrounding them when they first started to break away from the system, be a little, you know, a little rebellious and a little, you know, against the system. And I'm sure that happened in, in your case as well, over and over again, like you mentioned with, you know, the courts and maybe even family members and friends, you know, how, how is it like, a, how did you deal with that? What is a good way to, 
deal with all the outside criticism when you know that what you're doing is not just right for the world, but most definitely right for yourself? You know, I've always been accused of being something of a trailblazer or something. I mean, and it's that incorrigible nature that makes you just like uh, toss aside the conventional way of doing things and just um, doing it your own way. Really just, I mean, I don't know. I think so many people miss opportunities because they are concerned with security and I mean, their safety, their safety nets, their, you know, I know a lot of people, for example, who don't get out of like terrible relationships because that person pays the bills. You know, a lot of marriages I know that just, they hate each other, but they stay together because it's cheaper to keep her. Um, and just in general, all the things that we miss out on in life when we don't take risks. So, um, it, that I think that the two are hand in hand, you know, blazing a trail involves the danger of the fire that you're blazing with or whatever, you know, and it involves the risk of getting burned, the risk of, you know, failing. Oh my gosh, the risk of failing probably keeps, I don't know the statistics on this, but just the fear of failure, I see keep people from trying so many things. I mean, myself included, on a bad day, if I could wake up and not talk myself out of all of these mental in, infringe, impingements, um, impediments, if you will, you know, uh, the things I have to talk myself through, talk myself over, you really just have to abandon the fear of a lot of things, abandon the fear of failure, abandon the fear of getting hurt, getting burned, abandon the fear of just, you know, ruining everything or losing everything, I guess, you know, there's a certain point where if, unless you want that job and that security and you don't mind staying in that abusive relationship or toxic relationship or whatever that is, if you don't mind just sitting there day to day, things are the same, it's comfortable, um, that's always been my issue, I guess, is that I'm not more comfortable the more things are the same every day. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs probably have that in common. Like if we wanted to have the same thing happen every day, we would go get a job at a factory making widgets and we would stamp in and we would make our widgets all day long until it was time to stamp out and get in our car and go home. And there are some people who do that and they probably are perfectly happy doing that. And I'm not like, dissing them at all, but um, I'm just saying that one of my own personality flaws is probably that I can't stand things to be the same from day to day to day to day. Like I've always sought out a job that was something different every day, that takes me someplace different. I abhor the idea of sitting in a desk doing the same thing every day. So, you know, mortgages are perfect for that in this day and age because of everything is digital. Uh, you're not allowed to actually originate mortgages outside of the U.S. But even if you are outside of the U.S., if your processor is in the U.S., they can still process all your loan applications, pull your credit, everything else while you talk to people from wherever, they ha wherever you happen to be floating on your uh, air mattress, sipping your margarita or whatever floats your boat, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think it's just, I mean, if I was to tell you a lot of details about being fearless, it would start with being a teenage runaway and just being like a feral child on the streets that didn't care or fear anything. Um, and kind of doing that uh, for, a, you know, two or three good years before I decided to change my course, you know, like, I'm not sure, I, I'm, well, I am sure I did have something of a religious experience or a spiritual enlightenment along the way. And then when the opportunity to become a parent presented itself as a way to save my life and give me something to live for and to look forward to. And like my son was always my motivation uh, to be something that he could be proud of. Like I, I in my 
mind, there was no way that I could just let myself become that statistic that would make my son look at me and feel like I limited him in his life by my choices. Like that was not something I was willing to tolerate. And so that little boy gave me like the motivation to like knowing that someone was looking up to me now that was someone was looking to me for advice that someone was counting on me to show them um a good way of life you know that was you know maybe free of alcoholism and addiction issues that have been around you know his dad's side of the family and my own and you know a lot of those things are silent there's alcoholism in families that seems so normal and then looking back you realize that this horrible addiction has been controlling things behind the doors and you know so wanting to like I mean that was really what I was I guess running away from was that pattern of behavior that was like looming over me and threatening me that I was going to become like my family and like have this Irish insanity alcoholism going on along with like whatever else was out there in the, you know, community. I mean, now, uh, years later, things are much worse with the crystal meth and, and fentanyl and all of these things that people are poisoning themselves with. But like, you can ruin your life just fine with some alcohol, even if it's just beer. And I didn't realize until years later, like my dad always drank a six pack a day and maybe a couple cocktails at night regularly. And he was never a horrible person. And I always thought I'd never even seen my dad drunk. And then one day I was like, oh, shh, snap. I'd never seen my dad sober. Like, and I had this whole change of understanding and reality and perspective and perception and just this whole thing. But like, even though I couldn't articulate it at the time as a 12 year old runaway, like that's what I was running away from. And I did not want to be whatever was wrong with these people, like, and they failed and succeeded in their own ways. And I'm not trying to make it seem like my parents are horrible people or anything like that. They've like overcome their own issues. And, you know, my dad came from the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma from like extreme intense poverty uh, with a 14 year old mom. Um, my mom came from like, more middle upper class people in Pennsylvania but like you know they had so there was like this rich side and an impoverished side kind of and the rich side has just as many junkies in rehab as the poor side has moonshiners alcoholics uh whatever oxycontin you know hillbilly heroin whatever so uh it's interesting to see how it affects all strata of the economic structure you know the atmosphere it doesn't really matter and you can't really judge people on any of those bases but as a child knowing what I knew from what I had seen with my own eyes I knew I could not experience that much longer I didn't want to pass that on to my kids I wanted to do the opposite of that no matter what that meant and I probably had no idea what that meant but like once in a while it meant going and running away living in a treehouse for two weeks or it meant going to actual downtown San Francisco and running away and living on the streets in the Tenderloin in the 80s, having no idea that that was like probably one of the most horrible places you could be in the world. <laughs> like, uh, so yeah, I think I'm not recommending everybody be as extreme as I have been, but there is something freeing about abandoning your fear of a lot of things. Um, because I don't remember Winston Churchill or some politician said there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And I really marinated and reflected on that like a number of times in meditation and just in life in general. Like it really is the fear itself that is crippling. Like when you go and do the thing, you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Like jumping out of the airplane, which I actually have never done. But I'm assuming that the fear of building up and being on that plane and eventually taking that deep breath and calming yourself and getting yourself to jump off. Like it's that fear before you actually do the thing that's uncomfortable and that causes us to not want to do the thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. absolutely. 
Absolutely. And I, I, I mean, it's just one of those, one of those things that I think everybody needs to, needs to think about. Right. And I think you were the perfect example of that, just breaking the pattern. Right. Because a lot of times we get so comfortable in our pattern of living, whatever that might be, there's good, there's bad, like you said, but if you break the pattern and, and like you, like you did and create your own path, right. Blaze your own trail, create your own pattern. That's really when you feel the most free. It's not so much having something or, you know, having some material gains or certain amount of money or certain amount of income. It's more so, you know, just the ability and, and the action and, and the, I say the courage to go out there and blaze your own path and do the thing that you always wanted to do instead of living the way that, you know, whether if it's like a family history or your community or whatever, you know, other people are telling you how to live. Um, that's what I think really crippling a lot of people today is they're continuing down a pattern that they don't necessarily want to be. And mm -hmm. some people are so far down the line that they don't even realize it anymore. They don't even know. And, you know, just having you come on and, and tell stories like this, I think it's really inspiring for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people are going to resonate with this. And uh, if you guys are in a position to, you know, go out there and blaze your own trail, you know, do it right. Just, just go out there, do it. The only thing to fear is fear itself. And, uh, absolutely. So, yeah. um, just to, just to kind of, you know, just wrap things up here, uh, Stephanie, if you, you know, I know this might sound like a, like a, like a broad question, but if there's, you know, kind of like any last, last pieces of advice that just from your, your ears of wisdom and, you know, overcoming all kinds of challenges and adversity and, you know, blazing a trail that's, you know, brand new and your own and you're proud of, you know, what are some, I guess, like last pieces of advice that you can leave with anybody who is inspired by this, this interview and want to go out there and, and, and make it happen? Okay. I have a final little nugget for you. Um, I always tell people that if you're the smartest one in your friend group, go out and meet some new friends because those people aren't challenging you. And you're not going to challenge yourself if you're just the smartest, if you're the smartest one in the room all the time and everyone's always coming to you for advice as though you know everything and maybe you know a lot of things, but you still need to go out and meet some smarter friends that can help you become a better version of yourself because no matter how good you are, you can always uh, up it, up your game, up your um, vision. So, I mean, I, it kind of goes along with that not being stuck into a pattern kind of way of thinking um and you know it has to do with really broadening your mind your sphere of influence uh and really opening yourself up to new experiences and learning from other people and going out and finding some people that are smarter than you uh join there's networking groups all over the place for different types of professionals for all types i go to these events that are basically for anyone from real estate to landscaping to bail bondsmen, like any, all kinds of people come there because we're all doing business. So it doesn't, it doesn't even really help at all to limit yourself to just hanging out with realtors or lenders or because that's your competition. Like you need to hang out with some people who are going to be referring you to their friends and their family and maybe they're a plumber and they work on a lot of houses and they happen to know everybody that's getting ready to sell their house because they're in their doing all these repairs to get the house ready to put on the market. And now, even though you didn't really even think you liked plumbers very much or whatever preconceptions you had, now this guy's giving you a ton of referrals because you broadened your horizons. You went out and found some new friends and uh, maybe the plumber is the smartest guy in the room and you didn't even know that until you got to know him, you know? So that's Absolutely. what I think. Everyone should try to go find some smarter friends. I love it. I'm going to start doing that more, more intentionally now that you mentioned it, but I love it, Stephanie. I hope and, so. uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I want to thank you again for, uh, for being here. Uh, this was an awesome, wonderful conversation. I learned so much. I've inspired myself and I think everybody listening to this is as well. And thank just you so much. Yeah. And just to, you know, for anybody who is listening to this, who want to reach out to you or who want to follow you on your journey on social media, or maybe you want to get involved in some of the causes that you're helping and you're, you're serving and the communities you're serving as well. What are some of the best ways for people to reach out to you, maybe follow you or on social media um, or different things like that? 
Okay, I mainly am good at Facebook. Unfortunately, I do have an Instagram. It's stephanieboyd.loanofficer. I do have a website. It's stephanieboyd.com. And that's Stephanie with an F, just like Gwen Stefani. People used to always ask me if my name was Stefani. But then Lady Gaga came along and her name is also Stephanie with an F. And so since she came along with her movie, people have been calling me Stephanie again. So it's that kind of Stephanie stephanieboyd.com stephanieboyd.loanofficer um i'm stephanie boyd on facebook uh i do have some youtube i don't have my whole own youtube channel set up yet for this type of thing but um one day i'm i'm working towards that uh so yeah thank you so much for having me kobe this was so much fun yeah absolutely um yeah, so we'll make sure to leave all the uh, links in the down uh, in the uh, description down below in the show notes so everybody can find it. Uh, I want to thank you again, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. And uh, for you guys tuning in, I want to thank you for uh, tuning in and uh, we'll see you guys on the next show. Take care. Awesome. Have a great day.